I was working at early graveyard. My shift started at 8 o'clock at night. So I went up to an area in my district that is known for drug activity. So I picked up one vehicle that stood out to me. A female had um, been at another vehicle, saw me, and then she immediately went to this van and got in. I can uh, see that the male driver is watching me out the driver's side mirror. We operate on clues, or red flags as we call them, and that's, that's one of them. If they're watching me out their mirror, they obviously don't want to have police contact. So as soon as the female gets in the van, uh, he immediately backs up and starts taking off out of the parking lot. I immediately got a violation on him, and I, I turned on my overhead lights to pull him over. But he wouldn't stop immediately, so that's my other um, clue that this isn't my your ordinary traffic stop. So when I finally walked up to the driver's side window, passenger was already out of the vehicle. And so that's, you know, that's another sign right there. Her comment was, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And so that's my other, that's another red flag, because that's not a normal statement for a passenger to say. So at that point, I called for a second officer to come to my location just to keep eyes on her in case she didn't leave the area. 337, we stopped at Highland and 5th. 337. If I have a second unit, I have a passenger getting out. I heard on the radio I had two other officers who piped up, said that they were going to come cover me. And I knew they weren't very far off, so um, I was good with what was going on. As I'm standing there, he is sitting with his hands on his lap, just still as can be. I mean, it is like half a second. He's immediately diving for something underneath his leg. My brain told me is he's going for a gun. Even though I hadn't seen a gun, he obviously wasn't diving for you know, a driver's license or anything else. He was, he had the intention of diving for something that I knew was gonna hurt me. And so as soon as I saw him move and it registered with me that he's going for a gun, I turned to my right and took a step so I could get out of that window. And as soon as I took a step, my first step, I heard the first shot go off behind my head. I was working uh, late graveyard, which starts at 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock to 8. And I was packing up, getting ready to walk out. It was about 8.45. Uh, finished making my lunch, and my personal phone rings. It was a phone call from a guy that I knew was already on shift. I answer the phone, and he says, hey, she's going to be OK, but Michelle's been shot. He kept talking. I don't know what he said. I hung up the phone, and my brain was just racing. Uh, I went flying through the ambulance entrance, got the doors open. I turned the corner to walk down towards the two trauma rooms. I was not quite to the room when I could hear her laugh. And that was, like, that was the sweetest sound for me. Because I knew if she was laughing, she's good. I mean, I ended up with three wounds that were in and out that were through and through, and then one hit my vest. It was about an inch from the bottom of my vest. If I hadn't had that vest on, or if it had missed my vest, it could have done a lot of internal damage. I was, I was surprised by how well those vests can stop a 45 rounds at that close range. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Her role as a wife, as a mother, 
um, was so much more important. So being able to survive for those reasons um, and we can eventually retire and be old and broken and <laughs> chase our cows around together um, is, yeah, is just incredible. Being number 2058, I feel very, very fortunate because I got to come home and be with my family.